Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another rousing discussion in microbiology. Um, in this discussion, in this chapter, we're going to be talking about ways to control microbial growth. So we talked about um, in the previous chapters how microbes grow, how they use metabolism. Now what we're going to be specifically talking about are ways that we can, with our understanding of how they grow and use their metabolic abilities and, and the understanding of their genetics, how we can actually control microbial growth. So as always, I won't be reading all of these objectives here. But um, these are the object objectives of the chapter and the objectives of the discussion today. So feel free to go back or to look at the pages in your book for a more um, for more examples or details um, pertaining to each of these topics. All right. So moving on to a little bit of terminology to begin with. Um, drugs are any chemical that can affect your body in a physiological manner. So a lot of times when you just hear the street name drugs, you automatically think of illicit street drugs. But keep in mind that drugs can also be something as benign as Tylenol, baby Tylenol, um, if used appropriately. Chemotherapeutic agents are drugs that act against the disease. So antibiotics would fall into that category as a chemotherapeutic agent. Um, you probably see in chemotherapeutic, you see the term chemotherapy or that thought comes to mind. So for people that have cancer, they do undergo chemotherapy, and it's still a series of drugs, very, very toxic drugs that can also target the own body. So that's why it can be difficult for people that are undergoing chemotherapeutic treatments um, that are cancer patients, um, but it's also targeting a disease. Antimicrobial agents are drugs that treat infection. So you could say um, erythromycin, which is an antibiotic, is also a chemotherapeutic agent because it's acting against a disease that may cause you um, an ear infection. So a little bit of history behind the uh, chemotherapeutic agents and, and where an antimicrobial agent of how they began. Uh, we've already talked about Alexander Fleming and that his understanding of the role of penicillin. And penicillin is not that he um, he created penicillin. Penicillin was already there. It's a fungus. And he was able to find through his flat, floppy lab work that penicillin is actually um, is a natural antibiotic against a lot of gram-positive organisms, specifically against Staph aureus, which is what he was working with. Paul Ehrlich um, understood or saw that components of arsenic could actually kill microbes. So at that point, he started to kind of play around with these different components of arsenic because he knew that just giving arsenic to a patient was going to kill the patient. So using different elements of that arsenic or different um, compounds that containing trace amounts of it was able to kill a wide variety of organisms, including gram-positive and those notoriously difficult to kill gram-negative. Um, however, with his use of these compounds, we started to begin to see the beginnings of um, antibiotic resistance. It wasn't as widespread as it is now, but we started to see a little bit of the beginning of antibiotic resistance, where he thought this was the magic bullet to solve all microbial diseases. And we have now found that there is really no such thing as a magic bullet. We kind of consider this an evolutionary arms race, because as we develop more powerful antibiotics, the bacteria seem to be um, evolving and having more resistance to these very powerful antibiotics. And we just develop more powerful antibiotics. So we call it an evolutionary arms way. Gerhard Domat um, was the one to discover sulfonamide. And you'll probably remember just talking about sulfonamides before as they act as uh, competitive inhibitors. They look like PABA, which is a compound that microbes will need to undergo um, various parts of their metabolism. So sulfonamide actually prevents their metabolic metabolism, which therefore prevents their, the microbes ability to make energy and thus kills them. Um, Selman Waxman um, developed or came up with the understanding of um, antimicrobial agents that can be produced naturally by organisms in much the same way that penicillin is just naturally produced and it's just a natural antibiotic fungus. Semi-synthetics are chemicals that are altered antibiotics and they're going to be a little bit more effective, they last longer, and they're much more easier to administer than naturally occurring ones. So for example, penicillin is a naturally occurring antibiotic, whereas synthetics or semi-synthetics are going to have some components of them that are natural while other components of them are not natural. By having that combination or best of both worlds, you're able to get a much more effective antibiotic. 
Synthetic antibiotics are going to be those that are completely synthesized and built in the lab. So for things like if penicillin is a natural antibiotic on there, then amoxicillin would be like it's a semi-synthetic on there. So there are some aspects of penicillin that are being used in amoxicillin. And for something like pitocin, that's not an antimicrobial antimicrobial drug, but it is a drug that's meant to mimic oxytocin, um, which is used in, to enhance labor, to induce labor, that would be a considered a synthetic. It's something fully synthesized and made in the lab. There are no natural components, if you will, to it, although it's been designed to mimic um, another naturally occurring chemical. So how do antimicrobials work? Well, a lot of them work based on, as I said before, our understanding of genetics, cell structure and metabolism. So we're going to be targeting those three very broad categories. And within those three broad categories, there are different subcategories or different or specific different aspects of either cell structure, metabolism, or genetics that these antimicrobials can um, will target. A good chemotherapeutic agent or a successful one will be have selective toxicity. So we don't want something that is going to not only be toxic for the microbes that we're trying to kill, um, we only want it to be successful or selective for the microbes that we're trying to kill and not toxic to the patient's own cells. So we have to be very careful and there's a fine line between those. Um, antimicrobial drugs constitute the largest number and diversity of antimicrobial agents. Remember when we talk antimicrobials, we're not just talking bacteria, we're talking viruses, and we're talking like things like flukes or parasitic worms, but antibacterial drugs are the biggest in this antimicrobial category. Um, we don't have as many drugs to treat eukaryotic infections, and the reason being is that eukaryotic cells, um, even if they are causing a disease and we want to get rid of them, is that it's more difficult to develop those drugs considering that your cells, our cells are made, are eukaryotic cells. So a lot of the structures that we would target in a eukaryotic cell that's causing infection, i.e. the plasma membrane, we'd also be targeting the host cells or the patient cells. So it's a little bit much finer line to walk than it is for um, bacteria because their cell structure is slightly different being prokaryotic. And there are different aspects, obviously, the cell wall, um, the pepta, peptoglycan um, aspect of the cell wall that we can target that won't affect the, the patient or the host cell. Antiviral drugs, because viruses, um, especially if they're retrograde viruses, are going to make copies um, so quickly, and they don't always do it the exact same way, are much more difficult. Um, and they're also, um, and since they use the host cell's own machinery, they're just targeting the genetics of viruses to kill the virus is not going to be a very effective way because, once again, it will affect the host cell. So um, the number of antiviral drugs that we have are also limited, as well as for eukaryotic infections. Those drugs we have are limited. So here is a very interesting table of some different common antibiotics and semi-synthetics on here. So this it doesn't separate them out at all. It just uh, kind of lists them all. And then it shows for fungi or bacteria what is the antimicrobial agent um, that you could use. So mechanisms of antimicrobial drugs. We have some that are going to inhibit the synthesis of the cell wall. So penicillins and cephalosporins, vancomycins, um, they actually will prevent the bacteria from um, making more cell walls. So if they can't make more cell walls, then they can't prevent osmotic lysis. If they can't prevent osmotic lysis, then they are going to either swell a place in a, hyper, a hypotonic solution and burst, or they're going to shrink. Um, we have some that will inhibit some drugs that will inhibit protein synthesis. So tetracyclines um, do a great job of that in antisense and nucleic acids, um, meaning that if it's the bacteria can't make its proteins, and the proteins are memory the workhorse of the cell. So at this point, we're not just targeting cell structures directly like we do with the inhib inhibition of the cell wall. We're actually targeting um, the cell genetics. So if the bacteria can't make the appropriate proteins that are needed, for metabolism, for cell structure, so it's more of an indirect attack on metabolism and cell structure, um, and then the bacteria is going to die. Disruption of the plasma membrane is another drug or another class of drugs that will target the cell structure. Um, polymyxins are very good for that. Um, inhibition of general metabolic pathways. 
Um, Daxones, sulfonamides, those are going to prevent metabolism. And remember, the whole one of the big goals of metabolism is to make energy. So if it, the microbe is unable to make energy effectively, um, then definitely the cell is going to die. Screw in with the genetics here, inhibition of DNA and RNA synthesis. Um, drugs that will do that is the, the instructions of the microorganisms from the DNA to RNA to protein are going to be jumbled up and they're going to be messed up a little bit, then that's going to keep the microbe from being able to undergo binary fission or to do anything else that it's supposed to do, make different enzymes, make different um, uh, lipids or whatever it, it has to do, it screws with that and it definitely can't make um, it's not going to have the energy that it needs as well. And then inhibition of pathogens, attachment, or entry on here. Notice that this one is kind of off to the side. So this is more of a, a drug that's keeping the cells from getting into the host cell or into the human cell. So if the micro, most notably virus, is the way that it's able to um, continue its life cycle is that it has to get inside the host cell. By inhibiting the, path, the pathogen's attachment to the um, host cell, it keeps it from getting in there. So where viruses, if they can't use the host cell's machinery, then they can't replicate. So remember from the very beginning of the semester, we said that's why we're kind of on the fence of whether or not viruses are living or non-living because although they can reproduce, they can't reproduce without the machinery of the host cell. So. Um, if we can prevent the viruses from getting into the host cell to use its machinery, then those viruses are no longer going to be effective or able to make more copies of themselves and to continue to make the host or the human or the patient sick. So inhibition of cell wall synthesis, uh, most common agents prevent the cross-linking of the in acetylmumeric acid subunit that make up that NAG, NAM, or peptidoglycan cell wall. Um, Beta-lactamins are a very prominent um, group of inhibitors of cell wall synthesis. And um, when microbes are, are exposed to this drug, they have very weakened cell walls, and they're very susceptible to osmotic lysis. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on in this slide, so I'm going to highlight the for my class, the very important things that I want you to know for each of these slides. So definitely for the inhibition of cell wall synthesis, understand that it's going to prevent the building of those bacterial walls. Um, the most common agents, the way that they do this, that they prevent that cross-bridge linking of the NAG and NAM. Um, Beta-lactamins are the most prominent type in this group. And what the outcome is is that the bacteria are going to have weakened cell walls and they will burst in a hypotonic solution or shrill up, shrivel up and die in a hypertonic solution. Um, we have synesthetic derivatives of beta-lactamins. Um, they're more stable in an acidic environment. Um, they're not going to be less likely to um, denature as we would have to say were naturally occurring. They're more readily absorbed by the patient. They're less susceptible to deactivation, and they're more active against a broader range of bacteria. So these are semi-synthetic derivatives of beta-lactamins. So other drugs that will inhibit cell wall synthesis, we have vagomycin. Um, it interferes in this with the cross bridges that link the NAM subunits in gram-positive bacteria. Bactericin are going to block the transport of NAG and NAM from the cytoplasm. So remember, these are protein aspects that we're talking about. So proteins have to be made through that whole process of protein synthesis that we talked about in our microbial genetic chapter. So we have to go from DNA to RNA to protein. So once that protein is made, then it's going to have to be transported to through the cytoplasmic membrane to the cell wall to continue to build it. So what this drug will do is it actually blocks the transport of these proteins out of the cytoplasm. Iodizide and SM-butyl 
are going to disrupt mycolic acid. So this is, these are more effective against those bacteria that don't have a true cell wall, if you will. It's not made out of N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylmumeric acid, or the NAG and NAM. Um, it's slightly different. So as a result, they have a mycolic acid. So mycobacterium, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, they would need something that would um, inhibit the formation of mycolic acid. So um, isonazide, they're going to disrupt the myconic acid formation, and those are useful against microbacterial species. So when we inhibit the cell wall synthesis, um, as we've already talked about, these are all things that we've touched on um, today and in the last couple of slides. They prevent the bacteria from increasing the amount of peptidoglycan. Um, the inhibitors of cell wall synthesis don't really have an effect on the existing peptidoglycan layer, but they keep new peptidoglycan layer from, take, uh, um, from being formed if there is damage to it. Um, and they're only really effective for cells that are in that growing stage that are trying to make more peptidoglycan layer. So as you can probably imagine, for all my students that have had AMP or you've had some sort of pathophysiology course, um, that, that very early stage of an infection is when these are going to be the most effective when we catch the infection right away while these cells are still growing in populations and in numbers. So the inhibition of fungal cell walls, remember these are eukaryotic cells, so their cell walls are not going to be made out of either mycolic acids or peptidoglycan, um, the NAG and NAM, so it needs to be a drug that has a little bit different approach. Um, fungal cells are composed of different types of polysaccharides, and these polysaccharides are usually not found in mammalian cells, because first of all, mammalian cells, we don't have a cell wall that goes around them, but things like um, mannan, um, we don't find in um, and glucan we don't find in eukaryotic cells. So um, echinocans, echinocandins echinocan um, are going to actually prevent the enzyme that makes glucan. So let's highlight that for the inhibition of fungal cell walls. These inhibit uh, glucan synthesis because we don't have that particular polysaccharide. We have Glucose and glycogen, but we don't have glucan. We can also um, inhibit protein synthesis. It's another aspect of microbial, um, way that we can prevent microbial growth. Um, keep in mind that prokaryotic cells, they have 70S ribosomes, and eukaryotic cells have 80S ribosomes. So for we have a 30S subunit and a 50S subunit in prokaryotes and a 40S and a 60S subunit in eukaryotes. And I totally recognize those are max equal 70 or 80 respectively. However, the unit of measurement, the C, that's what the S stands for, um, does not, uh, once they come together, they metabolically lose some of the weight, if you will, and I'm putting air quotes around weight because we have a very different way that we measure the density of uh, ribosome or of protein. So uh, ribosome, rather. So with that being said, that we just are going to generically say 70S for prokaryotes and ADS for eukaryotes. So we can have drugs that can selectively target translation. So if we can't go from the language of nucleic acids to the language of proteins, and the protein's not going to be effective. So to inhibit protein synthesis, we have drugs that will target translation. Um, we have to be very careful with the types of drugs that we're using um, because the mitochondria and eukaryotic cell and the chloroplast of eukaryotic cells also have 70S ribosomes. So if we are just developing a drug or administering a drug that only um, affects the 70S ribosomes, then we're also going to have the 70S ribosomes that are made by the mitochondria also be effective. So the energy level of our patient will be effective as well. So we have to be careful with drugs that inhibit protein synthesis by targeting this 70S aspect of, of uh, ribosomes can be harmful for our patients. We have drugs that will disrupt cytoplasmic membranes. Um, some drugs can actually form channels for the cytoplasmic membrane and, it, and damage its integrity so uh, that too many things can get in and too many things can get out. Amphocytarin B is one of those drugs that will attach to the um, ergosterol and fungal membranes, and when that, it attaches to that, it causes the plasma membrane to be much more loose, 
um, and that the contents of it will spill out. Now, amphitheterin for human cells can also be problematic because ergosterol looks a lot like another sterol, which is called cholesterol. Cholesterol is embedded into the plasma membranes of eukaryotic cells, your cells as well, um, and sometimes the, the human cells are going to be kind of flaky, flaky and it can also kill human cells. So amphitheterin B, you have to be kind of careful with that. For bacteria, if we administer this drug for bacteria, um, it's not going to really work at all because bacteria don't have the sterol, so they're not going to be susceptible because they don't have the sterol. And there's sterol, cholesterol, ergosterol. Um, so since they don't have that, this particular drug, amphitheterin B, wouldn't be, um, they're not going to be super susceptible to it. Azoles and alanines are going to inhibit ergosterol synthesis. Um, polymyxins are going to disrupt the cytoplasmic membranes of gram-negative bacteria. So keep in mind, so for the azoles here, we are typically using this against eukaryotic cells, specifically fungal. It's fungal infections. If you go to the just your the Walgreens or CVS, you're just your neighborhood drugstore, and if you look at any of the um, um, over-the-counter drugs for um, athlete's foot or for yeast infections, a lot of times they're going to have azoles in them, um, and then the way that they're working is that they're preventing that agrosterol synthesis that takes place um, for the plasma membrane to allow it to have some sort of integrity. Um, it kind of prevents that synthesis, so the plasma membrane is very leaky, um, and it is kind of it kills the fungus that way. Polymyxins are what we're going to use to inhibit gram-negative gram cell wall or cell plasma membrane um, synthesis. So polymyxins disrupt the cytoplasm membrane to gram-negatives. Remember, gram-negatives are a little bit more resistant to a lot of antimicrobial drugs, so we have to use something that's a little bit um, more aggressive, if you will. However, we have to be careful with polymyxins because they can be toxic to human kidneys. So we have to um, be careful with the administration of this drug. Um, some parasitic drugs can act against cytoplasmic membranes as well. In addition of metabolic pathways, um, anti-metabolic agents are effective in the pathogen and the host um, their metabolic processes are different. So if your metabolic process is slightly different from whatever it is that we're affecting, this is a point in time when preventing metabolism in that parasite is going to be effective because we don't have to worry about it um, interrupting the metabolism within the host cell, your cells. So astrobacridone um, interferes with the electron transport in protozoan and in fungi. Heavy metals can also inactivate different enzymes. Um, agents that disrupt the tubulin polymerization and glucose uptake by um, protozoan and parasitic worms. Our metabolism doesn't work exactly the same way, so those are very effective. Um, drugs that block the activation of viruses, so preventing them from um, actually turning the switch on. They might still be able to use your machinery, but they will never be able to um, the way that they work is that um, they won't ever be actually be activated. So um, those are all great ways of dealing with uh, viruses. And then we have metabolic antagonists that are going to actually counteract the activity of uh, the, the um, bacteria or virus. Um, antiviral agents. Um, we can do some really cool things with them because viruses have a lot of aspects to them that we don't see in eukaryotic cells. So we can target um, very specific aspects of viral metabolism. Um, proteases interfere with the enzyme that HIV meets in its replication cycle, so it's very effective against that. Blocking nucleic acid synthesis and um, replication and transcription. Those are other um, ways that we can prevent that we have antimicrobial action take place. 
Um, however, as I said before, a lot of these drugs, that if they're going to be dealing with uh, components that are found in both eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells, that these drugs can also have a, a damaging effect on your cells. So we have to be careful with them. Um, we don't usually use these types of drugs to treat infections, but um, we can use them in research. And what we found in this research is that by using these types of drugs, may be able to slow the cancer cell reproduction because they're not able to get the instructions out um, very effectively um, to make new cancer cells. Nucleotide and nucleoside analogs um, as a method of controlling um, microbial growth, they're going to interfere with the function of nucleic acids, which remember, again, for using them just against infections is not going to be super helpful because it's going to also target your own cells. But the way that they work is that they're going to screw with the shape of nucleic acids um, and those molecules, and it keeps them from further replicating or further going through this process of protein synthesis so you're not getting these end products out. You're not getting the proteins out that are needed for the cell to survive. These drugs are most useful against viruses um, because viruses are really nothing more than, you know, a plasma membrane that surrounds or fossil lipids or a capsule that surrounds, excuse me, that's around some genetic material. So once we can get to the genetic material, then we screw with all the instructions for the virus, and it's no longer able to be effective. We've also found that nucleotide and nucleoside analogs are going to also be effective against rapidly dividing cancer cells. Ketones and fluoroketones um, act against a prokaryotic DNA gyrase and it's responsible for making sure that the genetic material, the DNA, yeah. kind of makes that super coil. Um, we have inhibitors of RNA polymerase. If RNA polymerase can't do its job, then we can't add on new nucleotides yeah. to make new messenger RNA, nor can we do that to, um, yeah. to yeah. DNA replication. Anything that yeah. happens reverse transcriptionase, yeah. um, reverse transcriptionase inhibitors yeah. that act primarily yeah. against um, the HIV virus and the replication cycle. This is a really cool drug. When this, for this one, once again, we thought we found a magic bullet against HIV because for humans, we don't have reverse transcription. We don't have that enzyme. That's only found in retrograde viruses, and HIV is a retrograde virus. So as a result of that, we thought, hey, this is going to work really effectively. But the trouble is, is that HIV is a sloppy copier, and we found that it was able to kind of make this reverse transcriptionase in a slightly different way or make slightly different copies of itself so it didn't work as effectively every time. So that's why for patients that have HIV, they're given what's called, you know, generically, the cocktail. The cocktail consists of various different drugs that are meant to target various different aspects of the virus in order to keep those viral load numbers in check. <laughs> Um, another way, since we're talking about viruses, of keeping a virus um, from impacting the host cells is that we just prevent the virus from attaching or entering into the cell or uncoding itself once it gets into the cell. So we have a series of drugs that are attachment antagonists that will actually block the virus's ability to attach to the membrane of the host cell. If it can't attach to your membrane, then it can't gain entry inside. Um, we have, this is kind of a new area of antimicrobial drugs that if there are other drugs that will usually get into the cell and then wreak havoc um, or make endotoxin, then if we can prevent those bacteria um, or those microbes from getting into the cell, then we can also prevent the infection from having it. Pleconidrol pleo, pleo, um, blocks viral attachment, and arildone blocks viral encoding. So the perfect antimicrobial agents are going to have all of these aspects to them. They're going to be readily available. They're not going to take forever to, to make in the lab. They're not going to have to deal with some natural resources that are at a shortage and we can't get to them right away. So they should be readily available that we can get our hands on it. Um, they should also be fairly inexpensive, so it shouldn't be a drug that is um, very difficult for people. And we're not just talking about um, people in our country and more developed countries where we are very fortunate and blessed to have um, access to uh, a wide variety of different types of drugs, irregardless of cost. 
Um, there are some cost prohibitive drugs, but uh, for, for some people, but there's usually some sort of syn um, synthetic or generic that's on the market that is just as effective. So for people in developing countries like for ourselves, we don't really have this um, uh, the drug being too expensive, although like I said before, there are some cases where there is a drug that's got a trademark or a patent on it, it's a drug that, um, a, a very specific drug and they don't have a generic for it, that yes, it can be very difficult for people to get their medications they need and also live off their income because the drug prices are skyrocketing, but I know that there are a lot of people that are um, working very diligently to keep that from happening. But overall, for types of different types of infections, for um, we're able to, to to gain access to the types of drugs that we need, um, regardless of income. But for people that are living in developing nations that aren't quite developed yet, something as simple as erythromycin that may be cost inhibitive for them. So that's something I'm talking about. They should also be chemically stable. Um, and we don't have to worry about them um, having a half-life that's way too short. Um, they should be able to be administered easily. It shouldn't, you know, the ideal drug. We want it to be easily administered, non-toxic, non-allergenic, so that people don't uh, develop allergic reactions to it, and selectively toxic against a lots of different types of bacteria. So from looking at all of these different components that we want our ideal antimicrobial drug to have, you can kind of see where this process is difficult and why pharmaceutical uh, agencies or pharmaceutical companies um, are multi-billion dollar organizations that they're trying to come up with this ideal antimicrobial agent. Or even just to hit some of the bullets on there. So spectrum of action. Um, this means that a number of different pathogens are going to be affected by this drug. So a narrow spectrum means that it's only effective against a few different organisms. Broad spectrum antibiotics, you've probably heard of that, which means they're going to be effective against many different or many different microbes on here. So they allow for with the use of broad spectrum antibiotics because it kills off not only the bad bacteria but also the good bacteria, those normal flora that we talked about or those um, normal microbiota that help your body actually, um, they can actually kill those off and it's going to allow for a secondary infection or super infection to develop and as we said before, um, kills off the normal flora which reduces your, your helpers of your microbes in your body, um, and it can allow for these secondary infections to take place. So that's just kind of the, um, the drawbacks of a broad spectrum antibiotic. So here is the spectrum activity of selected antimicrobial drugs. Um, notice here that erythromycin is effective from the scale of gram negative all the way through rickettsias. Um, tetracycline is kind of the same way, so thonomides kind of work like that. Streptomycin are really uh, most effective against microbacterium and gram-negative bacteria. Um, polymyxins are very narrow, so they're more of a narrow, um, they're more of a narrow type of um, spectrum. So just kind of look at this list um, and just kind of just absorb it. All right, so how effective is is antimicrobial drug? So the effectiveness is going to be determined or ascertained by the diffusion susceptibility test, um, the minimum inhibitory concentration test, and the minimum bacterial site concentration test. So what these minimal tests are actually looking for is that how much or how concentrated does the component need to be in order for it to inhibit the bacteria from doing whatever it is that we don't want it to do? So how much of it are we going to need to inhibit that? The minimum bacterial cellular concentration said, what is the minimum concentration the drug must have in order to um, kill the bacteria? The diffusion susceptibility test is that how far will this drug diffuse where it's still um, the, the microbes will still be susceptible by. So these are the different aspects that are different tests that are administered to see how effective an antimicrobial drug is. So 
If you've done the Kirby Bauer or use the Kirby Bauer method, the disk diffusion or the diffusion susceptibility test, um, that very first one, the Kirby Bauer method is basically what we're looking at here. So if you've been in my class, you'll remember that very recently we looked at the zones of inhibition of this diffusion susceptibility or what we call the Kirby Bauer test. That we're looking at this zone of inhibition or how wide across is that circle made. So notice that the wider your circle is in that lot of bacteria, the more effective that particular antibiotic is. The smaller it is, the less effective it is. And notice that for this particular drug, it's not very effective at all against this specific species of bacteria. Now, as you saw in lab, and as you'll probably see in lab in your introductory micro microbiology courses, that not all um, of these bacteria are going to be susceptible to the same kinds of um, antibiotics, that there are some antibiotics that um, work against some bacteria and some that don't work against others. Um, the um, e-test, which combines aspects of the Kirby Bauer test and um, minimum inhibitory concentration test with the August on lawn of bacteria. Um, there are also ways to determine how effective an antibiotic is. Um, the concentration of antimicrobial drugs and how effective it is um, is that we're actually going to um, have bacterial colonies glow in our minimal inhibitory concentration tube, and then we kind of uh, increase the amount of um, nutrient broth in there to see at what point how concentrated does the drug need to be in order to prevent microbial growth. Ways that we can administer antimicrobial drugs. Um, topical applications are good for external infections. Um, so something that's on your, your skin, we can do a topical drug for that because it doesn't need to go systemic. The oral route um, is also a nice method because it doesn't require any needles. You don't have to worry about um, uh, administering the drugs to the pe people because you have to deal with all of the, the needles and all the aspects that come with that and uh, the spread of bloodborne pathogens. So uh, you just take the medication orally. Intramuscular administration is going to give the, the drug via a needle into the muscle. Intravenous administration takes the drug directly into the bloodstream. And for any of these groups of administration, we have to ask ourselves, um, we have to ask ourselves how will the host cells or the patient cells be affected by this. So how will it be affected by this and how will we get the drug to the um, appropriate tissues? So here's a, um, a nice chart that compares the oral, intramuscular, and continuous intravenous, the effectiveness of the drugs and how often they're found in the blood. So just take a second to kind of look at this chart. So toxicity or side effects here, um, if we're not familiar with all aspects of the drug and what we're specifically trying to target, that's why we spent a good chunk of the first half of this lecture talking about how these drugs work, what they target, then you're going to have a lot of adverse effects. Um, because your liver and your kidneys are kind of your detox unit of your body, a lot of these drugs, just the same way that you took an illicit drug, are going to have some sort of damage or be toxic to your kidneys and livers, especially if the patient has to have this drug as a long-term use. So we have to look at whether or not administering this drug is kind of a fine balance, whether administering this drug and the toxicity level of it long-term is worth it. Is it, is it going to cause, is the drug going to cause more damage than the infection or whatever it is that we're trying to treat? Um, a lot of these drugs can also be toxic to your nervous system as well. So um, we have to it's a fine balance there. We also have to take special consideration when we prescribe drugs to pregnant women because there are some drugs, there's actually a schedule of drugs that they just say are safe. Um, for pregnant women, they usually fall in the, you know, the schedule A or schedule B, that anything in those two schedules, then we know that the amount that's going to be transmitted to the fetus is going to be minimal or that the amount when it's transmitted to the fetus isn't going to cause um, any damage to them. But um, there are drugs um, and antibiotics are on this, this, this scale that are, um, can be harmful. You have to be very careful with that.
The therapeutic index is the ratio is therapeutic index is the ratio of the dose of a drug that can be tolerated to the drug's effective dose. So what is the amount that can be safely administered without it being super, super toxic, but still having an effectiveness. So some side effects of these drugs, um, we can see things ranging from um, yellowing of teeth as a result of it. Um, you kind of have this um, carbonating or uh, the side effect of the drug um, coming out or manifesting itself on the tongue or in various places, various places of the mouth. Um, we have allergies and anaphylactic shock is a big issue or big side effect that we have to be very mindful of. Um, the disruption of normal microbiota, which can result in secondary infections, or you could have the overgrowth of normal flora that causes super infections. Um, our biggest concerns for the disruption of normal microbia a microbiota is for those patients that are in the hospital. Um, we also have to be careful of the development of resistance in populations, which we totally see that. Um, some pathogens are just naturally resistant, such as how they came here, just like you naturally have blue eyes or brown eyes or red hair or brown hair or whatever it is. It's just how you came here. Some microbes are just naturally resistant. Now, those that are naturally resistant, they can give that hey, I just happened to come here with a genetic mutation that made me resistant to drug XYZ, they can pass that through horizontal gene transfer um, to other microbes that didn't come here that way. So they can get past that resistance onto them. So the two ways that that can be done is that we can just have new mutations in the chromosomal genes, which we talked about, where you just naturally come here that way, or the acquisition of these resistance or R plasmids through these horizontal gene transfers. So either transformation, which means it just picks up the genetics in um, the environment from a dead cell, and transduction and conjugation. I probably told you all this story about my, my grandmother who recently passed away um, this past January and her doctor. So she's had the same doctor forever. My grandmother was in her 90s when she passed away, and I think her doctor was like in his 80s. So it wasn't like he was super, super young, you've been practicing for a long time. And whenever she would get sick, she would always, you know, go to the doctor and she would ask Dr. Clark for um, penicillin. And Dr. Clark was like, oh, okay, you're not feeling good, Miss Claire. All right, I'll write you a script for penicillin. And he would just write her a script for penicillin. Now, Dr. Clark probably shouldn't have been practicing medicine anymore, but he liked what he was doing. He liked getting out, and that's what he did. Um, so... Um, he would always give her a prescription for penicillin. And if she didn't take all of her penicillin, then she would give it to other people. She would give it to us. You know, we had a cold or we were sniffling. My grandma was like, oh, I got some penicillin in there. She was like her own little, like, pharmacy and giving penicillin. So with my grandmother and the overuse of penicillin, that's another reason why we're having a lot of this super bug. So thanks to my grandmother. Um, I love her dearly. And for Dr. Clark, I love him dearly as well. He, um... He helped to, they helped to proliferate this antibiotic resistance that we're seeing. So what was happening is that my grandmother, when she would take the drugs, and if she started to feel better, she would stop taking them. And so when she stopped taking them, then those bacteria that already were resistant to it, um, those that were still alive, they picked up some of those resistance factors, or they were able to have those resistance factors transmitted to them through conjugation. So by not taking all of your medication, you're leaving some of the population of bacteria there that made you sick, and they also now have the means to possibly pick up new genetics that will allow them to be resistant in, in subsequent generations. So um, we have it here, what we're looking at is the development of resistant strains of bacteria if we were to do this in a laboratory, and this is kind of the same thing that happens in your body. You have a drug-sensitive cell, which are most of these, but then you're going to have every now and then some that are just going to be resistant to it. So when we expose those cells to the drug, we're going to kill everything that's just sensitive to it. Now, those guys that aren't sensitive, there's only two of them, well, they're definitely not going to be affected by it. However, 
that remaining population is just going to continue to grow and continue to grow. So now on this plate, we're mostly consistent of cells that are resistant to this drug. So mechanisms of resistance, there are at least seven mechanisms of resistance, and I want you guys to know all seven of these mechanisms. Um, we can have the production of an enzyme that destroys or deactivates the drug, so that's one way that microbes can resist the drug. We can have microbes that are slow or prevent the drug from getting into the cell, um, so they don't allow it. Remember we said that the plasma membrane of microbes allows some things to get in. It's selectively permeable. Some things to get in and others cannot. So it may just be selecting for the drug not to get into the cell. We can have um, microbes that will alter the target of the drug so that the way that it binds to the microorganism is less effective or it binds to any of those intracellular structures. Um, microbes can even change their metabolic chemistry so that the drug that it's supposed to target, the aspect of metabolism that is supposed to be targeted by the drug will no longer work properly. We can have microbes that will actually, through their pores, can pump out the drug before it can actually be effective to the bacteria. Bacteria that live in biofilms are just naturally resistant to antimicrobials because they all have this quorum sensing and communicate with one another so that if the drug is supposed to be effective against one member of the population, there can be a message through quorum sensing that tells or lets other microbes to make a chemical to protect it, or just being in different layers of bacteria helps to prevent the drug from getting, gaining access to that bacteria and protecting it. Um, microbacterium tuberculosis produces a protein that binds the DNA gyrase that actually prevents the binding of fluoroketone drugs that are meant to um, inhibit gyrase. So it has a, a, a component to it, a protein, that prevents the drug from binding to that enzyme. So there are various different mechanisms um, that microbes can use to be resistant against drugs. So here's, again, that evolutionary arms race we're talking about. Multiple resistance and cross-resistance, um, there are microbes that can be resistant to various different types of antibiotics and they can acquire the ability to be resistant to different types of, of antibiotics. So they can be resistant to more than just one drug. Um, this is common when we have plasmids that are exchanged through conjugation. Um, we see a lot of this happening in hospital settings um, because they're constantly using the same drugs to eliminate the sensitive cells, whereas those that are just resistant to it, um, it's not going to work on them. They're just doesn't work, and then we have a less of the population of more cells that are not resistant to the drug. Multiple drug resistant pathogens are resistant to at least three different antimicrobial uh, drugs. In order to retard resistance, what we have to do, evolutionary arms race again, um, they have these different ways in which they can be resistant to a drug. We have to find a way to overcome those seven different characteristics that we talked about. So one way we can do that is a very high concentration of the drug um, in a sufficient time. So we can inhibit the pathogen so the immune system can eliminate it itself. So we're not directly killing it, but we're reducing the numbers of it and slowing it down, if you will, so that your own immune system can kill it. Um, using synergism. Um, finding drugs that work together with one another to try to kind of uh, to deal with the pathogen. Another way that we can retire resistance, and this is kind of, instead of going more high tech with our, you know, um, evolutionary arms race, which we have been doing, we're going to go more low tech, and that we're only going to use antimicrobials when absolutely necessary. Um, so unlike Dr. Clark that's constantly prescribing my grandmother penicillin, um, maybe just let her ride that cold out, you know, or especially if it's viral. Sometimes we give her, it might be viral, and you still give her penicillin if she asks for it. Um, so just letting her ride that whole thing out. Um, the development of new variations of existing drugs. So there um, are second-generation drugs and third-generation drugs that we are using. So from penicillin to amoxicillin to um, amphicillin, kind of just constantly evolving or changing. 
looking for new different antibiotics and synthetics and synthetics on here. Um, designing drugs that will complement the shape of proteins to inhibit the use of the proteins from breaking things down and building things up or affecting its metabolism. Those are all ways. We're even looking at new research um, on how to use viruses to um, infect the mic microbes that are making us sick. So it's kind of like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So we're looking at all sorts of methods in order to retard this resistance because this evolutionary arms race is kind of like that song, we didn't start the fire, it was always burning since the world's been turning. It's kind of the same thing here. We didn't start this fire, although we didn't light it, still we're trying to fight it. All right, so that's the end for this chapter. Um, and I will see you again for our next discussion. Have a great morning, afternoon, or night.